I'd like to introduce the uh, members of the panel. The first is Mr. Mohammed Syed. He is the founder uh, and president of the Ex-Muslims of North America um, and, and in an effort to take to save time so they could speak. Just you know, take a look at the pamphlet so that you could learn a little bit about them and of course they're going to speak. And to his left we have Sarah Hader. She's also the co-founder of Ex-Muslims of North America. And to her left is David Tamayo. Yeah, I'm trying to see. So David is, is to her left and Alex Jewell. So uh, it's a question and um, they're going to let you know a little bit about what themselves and what they do. And then uh, towards the end, we're going to have a question and uh, answer session. All right, so Mr. Syed. Hi, everybody. Hope you're having a good day. Um, so I'm uh, the founder of Exmos of North America, and we largely started as a community building and advocacy organization. Um, one of the issues that you generally encounter is people that leave Islam due to the consequences of that tend to keep to themselves, don't interact with other people, don't come out about their lack of belief, and we're hoping to change that. So we've been working in uh, various cities around the country and e in Canada where we've established about 18 chapters where people meet locally, um, interact with other people. And what we've seen as a result of that is a lot more people uh, have gained the courage to stand up to their families, to speak out publicly. And we're hoping that over time that will change the dynamic within Muslim communities where they're more accepting of apostasy. Um, Sarah? Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Hader. And I also work with ex-Muslims of North America. And I've been, uh, I've been an atheist for a little more than a decade now, but I left religion at a, at a young age and from a community where uh, atheism wasn't really something that we did. And I didn't know any other atheists or free thinkers or humanists even that came from my own background. And that's something that we're, we're wanting to change from, from our organization, that there is this there is this weird um, sense, I think, that atheism is just a, a Western white phenomena. But we want to change that perception because there are people like us out there. Hi, uh, my name is David Tamayo. I'm president and founder of Hispanic American Freethinkers. Uh, there are 56 million Hispanics in the United States. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's about 17% of the US population. Mm -hmm. And uh, African Americans are 12% of the of the population. Just to give you that perspective, and we we thought hard about the name of Hispanic Americans, uh, uh, free thinkers, and uh, and also a lot of other things like language we we would use and, and so forth. And we decided on free thinkers only because it is not just the question of the it's not just the God question or the God hypothesis that we're addressing. It's also all the other crap that it belongs in our culture. So when we talk about cultural appropriation and that kind of thing, please take all of that. We gladly give it away. The magic, the palm reading, uh, <laughs> all that other BS. So, you know, yeah, I mean, and I, look, to us, that may be funny, may be cute and all of that. The sad part is that by 2060, according to the census, one in three people in the United States are going to be Hispanic or of Hispanic background. Now, if one third of the population are not engineers, are not scientists, are not inventors, mathematicians, etc., we all get screwed. It's all of us. If someone, when you're old, is giving you homeopathy instead of giving you real medicine, we're all getting screwed. So, yeah, I'm doing this because I'm selfish. Uh, I, I, I want real medicine and I want to live in, in a reality-based world. And so uh, we noticed that there was nothing for the Latinos, for the Hispanics, for such a large number in the country. And so we formed the uh, Hispanic American Freethinkers to try to uh, move into that area. What he said. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's got notes and everything. I mean. <laughs> oh, look, he even has something about me. Alex Drew. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you liked me. Um, my name is Alex Jules. Is this thing on? Okay. My name is Alex Jules, and I love microphones. Um, I am the founder of Black Nonbelievers of Dallas. Uh, we were founded, I think it was 2012, about a year and a half after BN. I exist because of BN, quite honestly. 
Um, it is all about bringing the awareness that people like us exist. That's it. That, that is it. You need to find us. We need to find you. Know that you're not alone. I'll talk about me later, too. So it's like... All right. So uh, we're going to delve a little bit more about each organization. Um, I would like to uh, add a little bit more on Alex, Alex's uh, introduction. I also uh, met Mandisa in Florida um, in 2011, shortly after Hitchens died um, in a South Florida meetup. And um, uh, it, it, was a, it was a great uh, situation for me. And eventually after um, talking to some folks, I decided to start Haitian Freethinkers because I recognized that there was a, a, a hole to be filled um, in our community. So I just want to let uh, Mandisa know wherever she's at uh, that she's had an impact on me. And uh, I just think that what we're doing is wonderful. You, like, we underestimate it. But um, I really do think that we're making history, but uh, enough about that. So we're going to start with uh, Mr. Mohammed and uh, your organization. I think I covered it to a certain extent already. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so going back to uh, what uh, Dave and Alex were saying about uh, not being alone, um, a lot, of, pretty much the, every single person uh, we've talked to um, uses the line that I thought I was the only one. And I'm sure that's not only in ex-Muslim communities. Um, the issue is a, a lot of our um, backgrounds, be it Hispanic or African-American or uh, Muslim, ex-Muslim, um, in the popular consciousness, it doesn't exist that it's possible to leave religion because religion is such a big part of our communities and our identities. And we need to shift that dialogue where we're not defined by our irrationalities, but instead are defined by who we are and what we stand for. Um, We've already seen a remarkable shift within uh, Muslim communities. When we started about uh, two and a half years ago, um, the common uh, conception was that if you're leaving religion, if you're speaking up in particular, then you've probably been paid by somebody. Um, one of the common lines used is you're a Zionist shill. Um, so there's a, we often got things like um, Islam is the truth. And obviously, nobody is going to leave the truth. There is something nefarious going on over here. Um, but uh, within the just two and a half years, we've seen where um, Muslim students' associations and national conventions addressing the issue where they're concerned about so many people leaving Islam that it, I would say, every single national Islamic convention that has happened within the past year has talked about the problem of atheism and how the Muslim youth are being misguided and how we need to stop this from happening. So to me, that's amazing. Um, going from, we don't even exist, to, oh my god, what do we do about this? <laughs> okay, uh, Ms. Sarah? Well, I mean, I work in the same organization, so I've, I don't want to repeat too much of what he said, but I do think it's really important, I think, which is what everyone else is underlying, how important community is uh, to feeling uh, accepted and to your just mental um, stability in a lot of ways. And I think that these groups and, and what we can bring to the table is provide uh, people who are marginalized in so many different ways a chance to feel like they have that support, a chance to feel like they have that community, which is just, it's so powerful. And it is, like we said earlier, it's something that is underestimated in so many ways. And we have people, a lot of people that come up to us and they say that we've changed our lives or this is something that has, that has really had a huge impact on them and how they feel about themselves, how they feel about their communities. So I think we can, we can you know, push that envelope even more and work together in ways to do that. How hard is outreach in the Muslim community for you? Oh, it's, it's one of those things you have to walk a very fine line because you don't want to attract the wrong kind of attention. Um, but at the same time, you want to make sure that these people who are very isolated in these Muslim communities, and they are very isolated, uh, to be able to find us. So how will they hear about us anyway? So we have to sort of operate in a lot of covert ways. We don't really advertise ourselves too broadly at the moment. So we, we, we try and look for ways to advertise ourselves within atheist organizations and communications and internet forums. And that's a way forward for us for now. 
one of the things that we've been talking about is doing mainstream advertising, say billboards, things like that. And the con concern always has been, which is why we haven't done it yet, is what are the consequences of doing that? Because as soon as you attract the wrong kind of attention, you have to go underground. You have to, everything, the entire paradigm changes. So, so far we've been trying to do it slowly word of mouth. How is it that you continue to exist, though? I mean, there, there, there have had to been death threats or um, at least significant threats to you, your person. I know I deal with them, so I know you have to deal with them. So w what we're trying to do is to change that entire dynamic. So all, yes, there are death threats, but um, by empowering uh, a large group of people, we're hoping that they will be, uh, start speaking up. So when we started, it was just uh, us two that were speaking up. This year, one of our projects is we're trying to get um, those of uh, our members that are okay with uh, their face being out there to record video. So within 2016, we're hoping to have a lot more people that come out and speak out about this. So it's easy to target two people. It's hard to target 50, then 500, 5,000. So the, the more of us that speak out, the more the risk is spread out. And we're, that's what we're hoping to change because there are a lot of people in all of our communities that have left religion, but they're afraid, they're not willing to stand up because um, they're concerned about the consequences. But if we have a critical mass that starts speaking up, it'll empower a lot more people to do the same. D David was talking about numbers. Do you have any idea what your actual reach is? No, not at all. There's, uh, there have been no real studies done. Um, there's one, so within America, there's no real studies about people that have left Islam. In a few other countries, there is. Um, so on the more amusing side, in Egypt, uh, the government released, uh, the population is about 75 million. And um, according to the Egyptian government, there are 800 atheists in Egypt, according to them. Um, um, so you can understand. And you know them both. And you know them both. <laughs> <laughs> and a counterpoint to that, there was a Gallup study done in Saudi Arabia where it came out, according to them, it was about 5% of the population is atheist in Saudi Arabia. And within a year of that, you have the law passed in Saudi Arabia where atheism is terrorism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the idea here is that we want to normalize being an atheist in every culture, in every, in every aspect of it. And, uh, and the question really for all of us here, and I'm here as much as anybody to learn from each other, is you know, how do we do it? How can we reach more people? How can we be effective uh, and not screw it up? Uh, it's something that we, we think about it a lot in, in Hispanic American freethinkers. Uh, we have s s a lot of problems, a lot of social problems, where we, whereby, for instance, we have uh, young girls in high school that are getting pregnant on purpose because culturally, they're, you know, certain cultures of the, uh, of the Latino part uh, are uh, saying that, hey, you want to validate yourself as a woman, you need to be popping babies. And so part of what we say is, hey, zero is an option, okay? And go to school first and be independent and all of that. So what we found is that if we teach kids, uh, teenagers, how to think, everything else sort of takes care of itself. The atheism, the agnosticism, the questioning, and all of that takes, takes care of itself. So we, we tend to target a lot uh, teenagers. We go to high schools. We have programs in high schools where we go teach critical thinking skills. And, and it's really good. And the way I measure good is, you know, when the bell goes off and no student moves and they're still sitting there. And when the teacher says, all right, you got to go. And they're like, no, you can give us a pass. We'll, we'll, we'll finish up what we're doing then you know that they're, the kids are, are getting engaged. And that's kind of good because you know that they're going to come out, teach their children, hopefully, and eventually. And the more we bring this up within our communities and the more we come out, we tell people, look, come out if it's safe. Come out because we know that that's going to normalize things. So for us, that's, those are sort of the basic campaigns, you know, the basic targets. Going after the 75-year-old grandma, la abuelita, she's not going to change. <laughs> She's not going to change. She is, it is what it is. I, yeah. <laughs> I tell you, no. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, so you know, you, part of it is you have to know who you're going after and, and the methods, you know. And certainly, you know, we don't get as many death threats. If anything, uh, Latinos tend to be very apathetic and uh, we tend to uh, join too many things. Uh, for instance, in the last 10 years, more than 200,000 Hispanics, 200,000 Hispanics have converted to Islam. Yeah. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this is something that is, that's actually even seen in the 
I've heard from the black community as well that there are there are a lot of converts to Islam and there are people that are targeting them directly. Not only here, but in Africa where it's a completely different story altogether. We talk about religiosity on the decline in the West, but in Africa it's all encompassing. Especially when you start looking at what Islam is doing. You want to talk about, you know, a real battle of ideologies. There's war brewing in Africa right now between Christianity literally. and Islam, literally brewing. Right. Well, the thing is, they're spending like uh, a lot of petrol dollars, Saudi Arabia and other countries, um, in order to affect those changes. And obviously, we don't have the resources of a country that's spending hundreds of billions of dollars to proselytize. But we need to, whatever we're doing here will ripple outwards. So whatever books are written in America, for example, or say Richard Dawkins books, um, they're translated, they're spread out. And people do read those and leave religion and change their outlook on life. Um, for myself, I grew up in Pakistan. And uh, Carl Sagan deeply affected me. Carl Sagan never talk about, talked about religion. It was the same thing you were talking about. It was about free thought. It was about understanding the universe. And that appealed to me. I, I was still a Muslim, but I was a free thinker as a result of that. And eventually, I wound up really leaving religion. So we need, we need to be focusing on not just what we are doing in the US, but how it affects other people and how we can broaden this message globally. OK, so what's also very interesting is uh, how we actually do impact the, the rest of the world. Um, if you all remember the witch hunter, uh, that I think she was in Uganda, um, and she Helen, was trying. Helen. Kukul yes, something. Ellen. Yes, and uh, she was actually heading in a few years ago. It was about two, three years ago to Houston, right? Right. Where Where was the money coming from to get her over here? That was all Western funded, right? It was Christians that were generating the money and the demand to bring her here. And it was, it was only because of massive outrage and outcry that she didn't come here, right? And when you take a look at the money that is flown into places like Africa and the Middle East, funding proselytizing, where's that coming from? Here. So they're losing the front here, but they're expanding the front there. So that's why it's exceptionally important to get out the word and stop this now. I mean... Guess where those Gideon's Bibles come from? From here. They really, for, for all of us, for regardless of what uh, target group we're, we're trying to specialize in or trying to address because of cultural differences or language differences or whatever, the ultimate question that we need to teach everyone, white, black, or whatever, is how do we know what is true and what is false? How do we know, how can we determine that something is real versus something is imaginary? Most people and everywhere have never thought about that, about anything. They think they know, they assume, and, and then they go and, and buy their magic potions or whatever. So that's, I think that's the ultimate thing that we have to teach everyone. It's how to think and make that the norm and try to push that in our schools, in, in the schools. Again, we're not trying to teach them who to vote for or, or uh, you know, what uh, to think. We're just trying to make them learn how to think. And if, they're, if you tell everyone, look, Questioning is okay. Truth welcomes questioning. Anything that is true, people are always, I mean, and I tell this to the students. That's why the teacher always says, do you have any questions? How many preachers do you see after the, giving a sermon saying, do you have any questions? So that's... Oh, okay, but it does, we do have different communities. We serve a little bit different communities. The, the Latino community is... Is a little bit less religious, I think, by what a few points. <laughs> it all depends what you mean by a few. It's embedded into the culture. It, it is, and, and when we take a look at the African American community, we're at like ninety-five to ninety-eight percent, right? So that is a high retention rate when it comes to uh, when it comes to religion. And and so how do you how do you combat that, especially when it's not about it's not always about critical thinking or even education, because Oprah Winfrey is well educated, and I mean she. She pushes tons of woo, right? But we see it, we see it everywhere. We really do. Uh, for a lot of African Americans, actually you know, black people in general in the United States, uh, their cultural identity is, is embedded in re religiosity. It is part of the narrative. You can't be black and be non-religious. It, it just does not happen, right? Um, you can have a separation of church and state, but you cannot have a separation of church and race. Uh, one more thing. One thing that we have to do that hasn't been done very well is in sociology departments throughout the universities and, and colleges in the U.S. We have not really studied very much how the different cultures and the different groups get indoctrinated. 
So the Mormon church has grown in the United States tremendously because of Hispanic uh, people joining. Uh, same with the Pentecostals. You know, now they say, nuns have grown also, so I'll take credit for the nuns, though. Uh, <laughs> but uh, to, give, you know, to put a, a comparison, there's some, some people, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sikivu, if Sikivu I'm, yeah, Hutchinson. Uh, yeah. She, uh, she's done some studies and others where it shows, for instance, that in African-American families, the women tend to be the more religion, uh, the more religious. And the Latino, same thing. The difference is that when uh, an African, uh, African American woman changes religion, she typically doesn't drag the, all the males in the family. While in the Latino, they do. They they start with the daughter, then then ma, and then grandma, and and then now the the, the the women in Latino family are the keepers of the morality. They are the ones that teach the kids how to pray, that drag everybody to church. Come on, you got to be there. You got to be there. So. That if we can get a greater understanding of those processes of how people are getting indoctrinated, then perhaps as, as, as activists, we can then tackle some of those things and balance, a, a, balance it out a little bit uh, more. It's just my, my thought. Um, similar things exist in our communities as well in the sense of if you look at the West, often Islam is regarded, Muslims are regarded as some sort of monolith when uh, Muslim countries are from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific. There are roughly 50 countries with Muslim majorities, very different cultures, very different backgrounds, uh, but they're essentialized to all being Muslim and all having the same background and ideas. And it's not just that um, racists in the West are pushing, pushing this. You have religious groups that are trying to push that as well. Your primary identity is your religion, your identity with God. And that obviously prevents reform dramatically because as a, as a Pakistani, if you stand up and say, I don't really believe in your God, then you lose your entire community, you lose everything else. And it's not just that you lose your own community. Um, if people support you, they can lose their support system as well. So we've seen where um, somebody spoke up and their family did not ostracize them. And as a result, the families themselves were ostracized by the community that how dare you not reject your child. So it's a much more insidious way of uh, preventing uh, dissent from happening. And this is a, it's a pretty a strange thing, I think, especially for us, where minority communities in, in America, that this essentialization of race and religion impacts us in a very direct way. Because I think what I, my experience has been that I've been called a traitor to, to my the people, culture. to the, to the people, to the culture, to the race. I mean, and it's, it's such a, it's such a strong, um, I mean, it's, it's a very strong force to pull people back into religion because they really do have to abandon everything. If they do abandon their religion, they have to abandon the ethnic background, their culture, um, all sense of self. And so that's why it becomes so difficult. And the thing is, the cultures vary dramatically. So I'm from Pakistan. We have our own music. We have our own food, own dress. own And our history predates Islam by like 3,000 years. Um, same for Egypt. Egypt is one of the oldest civilizations around. Um, all of these countries have uh, histories that predate Islam by thousands of years. that have their own cultures. But due to the power of religion, um, a lot of it has been forgotten. So in Pakistan, um, when we were taught in school, our histories start at the 7th century when we became Muslim. Whatever happened before that is never taught, never mentioned. It didn't exist. And the same exists ac across most of the Muslim world. And we need to combat that. So by um, promoting alternative identities of our own origins, of where we're from and what our ethnicities are, or um, that our uh, identities aren't tied into religion, we're more than that. Um, that gives people room to actually stand up and change. Well, sort of related to that, uh one of the big problems that we've found so far in, uh, in fighting religion and fighting God and gods, et cetera, is that it's what you alluded to, and that is that uh, they see it as, as a cultural uh, being a traitor. But one of the things that we find ourselves preaching, I guess, is to say that it's okay to question culture. Culture is man-made. The culture in the United States today is very different than the culture of 1950s. Uh, some things are, uh, you know, are diff worse. Some things are better. You know, it's better that we don't have uh, lead paint. I'm not so sure. It's not good that I can't have whiskey in my office. But, <laughs> but you know, the the idea is that, you know, cultures are also man-made, and and so it's okay to tell people, look, it's okay if this is part of the culture, and we need to change that in the culture. Fine, let's invent a new culture now, or modify the culture, and now we have a better culture that we can live by and and be have happier lives that way. Um. Is that really water now? <laughs> Let me put it over here. <laughs> we, had, we had a question. I saw your hand. Kathy? Yes. I'm from Huntsville, Alabama. 
and I'm very white. <laughs> but my question for this panel is, where is, whoa, where is the balance, quite frankly, the North Alabama Free Thought Association, a large organization in the north part of Alabama, is mostly looks like me. So I don't know if affiliations publicly you know, promoted. I don't know what to do to diversify us more. Uh, we do have some African American members, wonderful, but they are not necessarily out. And so we can't use them as a public spokesperson to say, and I know that I can relate so well to white Southern women, you know, because there's those commonalities there. And if you give me two minutes with you, I don't care what color or race or whatever you are, I can relate to you. But what, the way I look stands in the way sometimes. So I know there are organizations like that across the South, probably more in rural areas maybe, but what can we do in our group to facilitate more diversity? And do we invite all of you to have a chapter in Huntsville, Alabama? What do we do? I'll give my chance to think. <laughs> so, you know, uh, if you say I'm Latina, they'll believe you because Latinos come in every color, shape, forms, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I'm white. Yeah, yeah, that does not work. <laughs> so, no, really, uh, so for Hispanics, they usually something like uh, just a one word, you know, bienvenido, you know, welcome, uh, or something in, in science or something like that. It's just a good way of bringing in. Majority of Hispanics in the U.S. speak, speak English. And, uh, and so part of the reason that we made our uh, organization with the official language of English you know, not only because we're in the U.S., but also to encourage people that it's okay to change uh, cultures, to change things, and to change of doing things, and that if you can speak both languages, hey, even better. Bicultural, but you know, you get to enjoy twice as many things and reject uh, probably twice as many things too if you're a free thinker. All right. So for the African American community, it's a little bit more tricky than that. Uh, because there is a massive amount of, of mistrust or distrust between the races still today. Surprise. Um, and, and there's a lot of history that we just can't get over. Um, one of the things that I often tell people that I want to diversify my group, and it's like, well, that's kind of the wrong tactic. It shouldn't be about diversifying your group. It should be about finding those seeds that need to be planted out there and making sure they have an opportunity to grow. So it's no longer about you, it's very much about them, which means that you're not trying to get them in your house, you're meeting them out in theirs, right? So you have to cross that railroad track, that sometimes very, very real railroad track, and meet them there. Um, that's actually one of the things that, that we had to learn the hard way in, in Dallas, where we were setting up meetups and you know we were having uh, white groups that were hosting all tons, all types of, of diversity uh, events and activities and I was still the only black person to show up. Why was that? Well, because I live five minutes away from the place. Where, 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 where does everyone else live? So you've gotta get there. And then you have to make some very uncomfortable partners sometimes, because where I find humanist isn't always where I find white humanist. And that means that sometimes I have to partner with churches and br really begin to look at facilitating bridges. Um, and then I tend to find a whole lot of people that may be very irreligious or right on the crux of leaving religion. And they just don't know you exist because they're not looking for you. So you go looking for them. You go find them. And you empower them. And then you get out the way. That's the important piece. Then you get out the way. All right, we had a, another question. Yeah, sure. In an age of um, neo-fascism, stated loosely, uh, probably primarily aimed at your, at your uh, background and at your uh, background as well, um, in this presidential cycle anyway, do you use that as a catalyst to, to encourage people to leave the faith, to make a cultural change? Do you find that that's more likely to galvanize them and, and, and make them uh, just want to stay where they are and fight back? I mean, what, what do you do with what's going on in this country today in the current presidential cycle? 
usually um, when you feel under attack, no matter what the source is, uh, people tend to band together regardless of whether they should or shouldn't. And we so, sort of see the same thing. When Muslims are attacked, my entire family is Muslim. Obviously, I'm going to stand up for them. Um, so what we see is people less reluctant to stand up and speak out and talk about the problems going on within the community, and that makes our job harder. Um, so uh, on, on the one hand, we shouldn't be paying attention to those that are doing this. On the other hand, um, un unless uh, we're able to mitigate that to a certain extent, people won't stand up, won't fight back. And in essence, um, I would say people that are doing that are mirror images of uh, Saudi Wahhabis that are trying to do the same thing. They're trying to pull everybody together into this one monolith that, that everybody is a Muslim. And then you have the right wing, uh, some people in the right wing that are trying to do the same thing, that all of, uh, all of these people are the same and all of them, regardless of whatever derogatory language they're using, they fall under that umbrella. Um, so from, I don't know, it's uh, from both sides... We're, we're trapped in that narrative, and we need to stand up and say that there's a massive amount of diversity within Muslim communities, and there are Muslims that are actually very... So um, Sarah gave a talk about this, that um, the perception that well, often is that uh, religious groups in the West are usually regarded as what? Right wing. Um, but for some reason, we view religious groups from the East as not being right wing when it's the exact same uh, phenomena. They're trying to push in the exact same direction as Western uh, religious groups are. So instead of allying with um, the religious right of the East, ally with the secularists of the East and sort of uh, help them stand up and push back against these narratives both in the East and in the West. Well, the kinds of things that, especially if you're referring to Donald Trump's comments, um, <laughs> they're a gift to extremist recruiters. I absolutely believe that. Because when you push people into a corner and you say that uh, they are less deserving of the same sort of civil liberties that everybody else gets, then you make it more difficult for people like us to talk in a more nuanced way, in a, in a way that is critical of the religion, but accepting and tolerant and protective of the people within those religions. And it's a hard line to walk, but that line becomes blurred because of comments like, like those. Uh, and it's it's quite a shame, actually, to hear it. And so I think it's more important that people like us talk about these issues in a more nuanced way. For 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 us, it has it has brought up uh, it has helped in a way. Uh, I gave a talk in Puerto Rico recently. I I figured, hey, I'm never going to have as many Latinos in front of me as in Puerto Rico, obviously. <laughs> And so I did a talk that a lot of people didn't like uh, called, uh, what the fuck is wrong with us? <laughs> I couldn't think of better words. And it was a lot of, I, I got a lot of criticism for it. I got a lot of criticism for it because it was, it was, I was talking to the Latinos and I said, look, how is it that 20% of Hispanics are supporting Donald Trump? It's ridiculous. But it shows perfectly why it's critical thinking that we need to empower, because it's not just for religions, for everything. And it affects us in, in more than one way. So in a way, yes, it's helped to be able to show this, to be able to show that, uh, hey, you know, how is it? And of course, you know, a lot of the people, a lot of other Hispanics that are religious and are against Trump or, or anyone that spouts that kind of uh, uh, racism, they, uh, they then see a little bit, oh, well, maybe these atheist people are not as crazy as we think they are. And, and so in a way, it opens doors a little bit. But it does make you wonder about that percentage that is supporting, that, uh, of Hispanics that is supporting Trump with signs and, and, and all of that. In fact, he, had a, he went on TV with this woman saying, I'm a proud Colombian to be you know, voting for Trump. So yeah, good point. Thanks. Yeah. Do I have a question up here? Oh. oh. Uh, my question is uh, directed toward Alex. Alex, man, I, I feel for you. are in Dallas. Um, first of all, how far is your organization from the land of T.D. Jakes? Um, what kind of pushback have you gotten from them? Have you tried to reach out to them? And how do you think is, is the best way to, to reach them? Because, I mean, and then talk a little bit about the bus thing. T.D. and I go back a long way. <laughs> um, yeah, the bus thing. Actually, um, we are, okay, a few years ago, we had a campaign with the African American for Humanism uh, campaign. It was a national campaign, 12 cities. And um, there was my face, and I think the slogan was, doubts about 
religion, you're not alone. And it was Langston U, so it's me and Langston. And I didn't get a choice in where they were placing the ad. It just turns out, I'm going to be talking about this in about an hour, but the, for those that don't are here for the talk. But uh, it, was a, it was placed about a mile away from the Potter's house. It, I didn't choose the spot. Sounds like the perfect spot. It was the <laughs> perfect spot. I was so happy. Um, but, but, the, uh, but the press crucified us because they said that we were really targeting the African-American community. And, of course, we need, we need church. We need religion, right? I mean, it's, it's who we are. Uh, when things get rough, we have to defer to God, which I argue with all the time. And um, uh, trying to reach out to you know, people like TD or um, any of the coalitions can, can be really very difficult because they, they see it as a fight. They see it as a real argument. I'm encroaching not just on an ideology, but financially it has impact on them personally. Right. And I've been told that I've been told that I was like, you're going to take this money out of my pocket. I'm like, OK. Um, a few years ago, we also had a bus ad that, uh, again, we didn't control when it went out. Um, it was in Fort Worth and um, it was just a, a, a mixture of various faces. Uh, millions of Americans are good without God. That's it. Not very controversial. Right. No, not a big deal. Uh, however, my face was on it. A black face was on it, and it happened to be running in black neighborhoods. So, of course, we were targeting them, and that resulted in a threatened boycott. Just just go with it. They were going to boycott the buses to get the ads off. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was actually great, right, because it... Um, <laughs> It news. Oh my goodness. We I, I want to say we got close to two million dollars worth of advertising, um, but it was uh, it was about four buses and someone else eventually hired a, a mobile advertising van to drive behind these buses. <laughs> right. Millions of good millions of people are good without God. And this other one says, God still loves you. It was it was it was amazing, and they really just drove around <laughs> Fort Worth following this bus. Um, so eventually, this this really pushed um, the city to have a a uh, a town hall meeting. I was there. I got the looks from. I mean, seriously, they they if they did not know why I was. Some of them didn't know why I was there. They're expecting that I was going to be speaking on the other side. And when it came to the atheist talk, it was like I was I was right up there and I was making some really good points. Um, but they came back and told me outright, it, it's already been settled behind closed doors that we will not advertise any religion on buses anymore. So you're you're getting kicked off the bus, but so are they. That was the only way that they could avoid getting a lawsuit, which was kind of a win, right? It was still a win. You know, if you have to cut off your nose to spite your face, go for it, right? Be happy. Um, but what that also did, um, it, it did stop a lot of the relationship building that we were doing on a lot of fronts, right? Because that was something that impacted them very personally. And it... Um, uh, people stopped returning my phone calls really quickly. And so when we were trying to go out there and fundraise, go out there and help people, the humanitarian efforts, um, we had all kinds of things that we were working on together with other ministers. We got put on a blacklist real fast. Question? It should be on already. It's already on. Okay. Um, actually, I've Two. The first one is I, when I was in Memphis at the American Atheist Conference last spring, I took a bunch of flyers for this conference back with me to Augusta, and I wanted to distribute them, but I couldn't figure out where I could leave them, that where there would be a large collection of African Americans other than at black churches, so I didn't know how <laughs> beneficial that would be. So later on, if anybody has suggestions for next time, I'd appreciate it. But my real question to the panel is, we have, I lived in the Middle East for four and a half years. I worked at a university. I know there are a lot of Muslims who, you know, have been raised in their faith, but they really are curious or they're ready to get out and just because of where they are, they can't. 
but with all the paranoia we have in this country now uh, about letting the Syrians in and the other refugees, if there, what do you think of a combined, um, if the, all the groups got together, the free thinkers, atheists, humanists, and, and we made a political announcement, we want the refugees to come. For one thing that would say, you know, we're not pro-religion in any way because we're, we're non-believers, but we think it's okay. And I think a lot of those people are not only trying to escape the war, they're trying to escape the religion. I really believe that, just from what I know having lived in the Middle East for four and a half years. Um, so I would say uh, that's a bit of a generalization, uh, the amount of people that are willing to or looking to leave the religion. There's a small percentage that are aware um, of that being a possibility. But I was saying earlier, like when we talk to people, um, usually the response we get is, I thought I was the only one. So there are people leaving religion in the Middle East, but it's a s relatively small percentage. Um, regarding helping refugees, of course we should. It's a humanitarian crisis and all of us need to play our part in helping that out. But um, one of the issues that we've seen is um, doing it, it with our eyes closed, that you're, you're bringing in people from a different culture. So even within America, there are differences between Dallas and DC. Um, the response you will get to a specific issue in DC will be different than what you will get in Dallas. So there is a wide variety of people in the Middle East. Some are more liberal, some are more conservative. And when you're bringing them in, you need to have a plan in place to integrate them. Um, otherwise, you will have problems like you've seen in Germany, you've seen in other places. It's not that there are uniformly there are a lot of bad people. It's just you have uh, cultural differences that need to take into account. And you need to provide programs to re-educate people and integrate them in a, in a different context. Um, most people that I know, and even myself, moving to the West, there was a huge culture shock. I was liberal. I was all, I've always been supportive of feminism and humanism. But moving to the West, I had never encountered things in the way I did. And it took me some time to get over that and integrate better. Um, so as long as we do it with an open mind and with actual programs in place, acknowledging there are differences that we need to work around, there's no reason why we can't come together and make this work. I was thinking of it more of what we would be saying to the nation at large, that here we are atheists, non-believers, but we're willing to welcome people of a religion into the country for humanitarian reasons. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Well, uh, so this, yeah. in a way, this is uh, close to the immigration issue. Uh, one of the problems that I see in the U.S. as a country that we have is that we're very lasered on, on, on a few things. Uh, before the attack in Paris, the day before, there'd been a bigger killing of similar magnitude, uh, of a similar way in, in the Middle East. No one, you know, hardly anyone heard about it. For decades uh, now, I said, I said decade and a half, uh, the people in Darfur have been murdered mercilessly and, uh, uh, and also, they're, they're, they're uh, Muslims also, they're, you know, no one, we have no interest as a country in there. And so, so when I see a lot of those things and, and I see that there is suffering throughout the world in different places, it's hard for me especially to put in the organization to the front of, of something like that uh, when then everyone else is going to jump in and say, yeah, but there's also there and there's also there. And, there's, and before you know it, we're now doing uh, foreign policy, which is very complicated to say the least. And, uh, and, and it sort of the, one of the things we have to watch out as our organizations is try to not get distracted from our core goals, from what we're trying to achieve, because it's very easy to go on a lot of different other kinds of nice things that are good things, but uh, takes us and deviates us from, from our goals. Um, I'm going to have to uh, interrupt and say, unfortunately, uh, our time is up. But I want to thank you for all your questions. I know you, you still have more questions. Please t take the time to speak to the individual panelists uh, when there's some downtime, but we have to keep the program moving. So I thank you for your time. And Mandisa, thank you. Thank you.